What's up, fellas? Well, it's Scotty back again. A little 2020 action, and you're asking yourself, what the heck is 2020? 2020 is where I go back after a tournament, post-tournament, after all the videos have posted, and I kind of give you hindsight 2020, right? What I did right, what I did wrong. You know, this this tournament here for me was was a tough one, and we'll get into that in a minute. It's, uh, it's what I consider a little painful, to be honest with you, and I've, I apologize in the videos that's already been up. Um, I just really didn't get it done this last week. But that being said, it's a learning experience. You know, sometimes you gotta stub your toe a little hard to uh, learn a good lesson. So it's kind of like a rededication for uh, the rest of the season. So first, let me get into the videos that have been dropping on the channel. You guys have been very big supporters of the channel. We're growing and looks and guys, thank you so much. So if you like what we're doing, please subscribe to the channel. And here's what I'd like you guys to do. We've got a large, loyal base of fans, right? You guys are giving us some great views, some great comments, some great likes. Here's what I want you to do. If you're watching this and you're a fan of what we're doing, share it, okay? Share it on your Instagram, share it on your YouTube, share it on your Facebook. However you can, let people know we need to get some more people. We wanna keep growing this channel so we can keep bringing you good videos. So that's, that's number one. Number two, practice video is up, tournament video is up, and this will be the 2020 video going into it. Okay, so let's do this. Let's jump into a couple house cleaning items first before we dive into the meat of this 2020. Really important stuff you don't wanna miss. Number one, you wanna fish with me? You wanna fish with me down here at Lake Okeechobee or somewhere around the country? Then you need to check out the AFCO website. You need to check it out. There's a Fish with Scott contest. We're gonna be picking a winner real soon. So their time has not run out yet. So jump over there and sign up. It doesn't cost anything. All you gotta do is put your name in a hat. We're gonna pick somebody to go fishing with me all day. We're gonna film it. Spinner Worm's gonna be with us, so it's gonna be a lot of fun. That's gonna be a really, really cool thing. The other thing is the Fish Brain app. You've seen me posting on Instagram lately with the Fish Brain app. It's awesome. It's where I'm taking photos of fish that we caught, giving a really detailed explanation of how we caught them and where we caught them. When I say where, I'm like literally dropping a pin, GPS pin, on a satellite map to the exact location on some of our fish catches. So if you're gonna fish some of these lakes that we are just now leaving, you can check out our Fish Brain uh, profile and you'll see where I've caught some of these fish. Now, I know a lot of you are thinking, hey, why don't we, we don't want to know where you fished at the Harris chain because you didn't do all that great, but I promise you guys, I was around a lot of big fish, so we dropped some pins on that one. Last thing is, world's greatest deal. If you are a current member of FLW, meaning you fish BFLs, Costa Series, FLW, Co-Angler Pro, whatever, you can sign up for this app Save tons of money. We used it at the Harris Chain. It was really great. We actually went by Hardee's and got like a buy one, get one free on burgers. It was really, really good. You can get deals from hotel rooms to gas to food, all that kind of stuff. So if you're an RFLW member, be sure to click the link in the description down below because every dollar you can save on the road is more money you can spend on gas in your boat and fishing tackle. And that's always important. So enough of that. Now, here is the 2020. So the tournament for me was not good. Okay, for you guys that know where I finished, I finished like 93rd or 94th or 90 something. It was bad. I looked at it one time and I'm not gonna look at it again. But I didn't fall that far in points. So that is an upside. Typically, when you have a, a bad tournament like that, a pretty good tournament at Okeechobee, bad tournament usually would, you know, I, I, I kind of thought I'd be in 50th or 60th place in points which is outside of the cup range, but I'm actually in 38th, so I didn't fall that far. And the reason for that is there was a lot of flip-flops. Guys that did good at Okeechobee didn't do good at Harris. Guys that didn't do good at Okeechobee did good at Harris. So little inconsistency there across the board on the entire FLW field, so I didn't fall too far. So I'm still in the, the cup qualification right now. We still have a lot of events to go, so I'm, I'm, I've got a little pep in my step for that. Now, jumping into the tournament, for me, Tournaments are always about, and this is real serious guys, tournaments are 100% about focus, planning, dedication, and decision making, okay? My focus wasn't that great this last week. I'll be honest with you. I don't like to admit that, but I, it really wasn't. I had a lot of things going on. We, we filmed an SMC for TV uh, on our day off. We filmed an SMC for TV a few days before we came down there. We had to film another one right after the tournament, so I had a lot going on with trying to get the TV stuff done, which takes a lot of time. I mean, the TV stuff is actually, eats up a lot of, of, of space in my brain to figure all this stuff out. Because I produce the entire thing, I organize the entire thing, and uh, it takes a lot of planning. And, and then also going to a tournament, 
first tournament of the year where you travel. You know, I've got four kids at home. A uh, lot of going on there when you first take off. It, it, it can be a little stressful. You, know, you get a little homesick, I'll be honest with you guys. It's, uh, it, it takes a lot of focus and dedication. The other thing is I went up there a few weeks before the tournament started with my daughter Hillary, and she caught a giant bass. She caught a giant bass. We're going to show you that picture. Isn't that cool? Look at that bass. That thing is gigantic. It's her biggest bass that she's ever caught. She caught it sight fishing with me on the Harris chain. And, uh, and I spent another day after that as well, just really caught a lot of big fish. A lot of fish were spawning really, really good up before the cutoff. And really what happened was, I hate to say it, but we got, Florida got almost too good a weather. I mean, we had like calm conditions, very consistent high temperatures. The water temperature rose really fast. And a lot of those fish that we all thought were gonna make another move and spawn kind of didn't happen. I really, I really think most of the fish were, were leaving, going out to the post-spawn, you know, areas, which is like main lake grass beds, a little bit deeper water, eight, nine, 10, 12 foot of water, kind of where the guys caught them that did good, you know, and, and, and I kind of picked up on that the first day of practice and I said it to myself and, and I said it to other people and I just kind of kept trying to find that secret little place maybe where they're spawning because look, they're not all done spawning. I could have found one little secret spot or a little hideaway corner of the lake that had a, a nice group of fish up, but I just never did. So I spent probably half of my time or maybe a little bit more of half of my time up shallow looking around trying to see if these fish were coming to the beds. and. Every minute I spent up there, now looking back, hindsight 2020, right? Every minute I spent up shallow looking was time wasted because if I'd have been spending that time offshore looking for those, those irregularities in that hydrilla out there, the big open holes, the different things that were going on offshore, the schools of fish that were out there, then I would have found several more places out offshore. I did catch most of my fish out offshore, believe it or not. I just didn't have that many places you know, and once the tournament starts and you see a group of boats over here and you see a group of boats over there, and obviously that's not where I fished, you know, it, you, you, it's kind of etiquette is you just don't go rolling up in this, into another spot. You know, during the, during the tournament, you're not going to just roll up into a big group of boats where you haven't been fishing and just start fishing. So I was a little boxed in with just a couple places that I had offshore. You know, this, the, the third day of practice, I actually found a really neat spot out offshore. Billy caught his personal best bass. He caught his biggest bass he's ever caught, seven and a half pounds. Uh, check this picture out. This is awesome. Look, look at that smile on his face. I mean, Billy was freaking out. The first thing he said was, dude, this is this got to be my PB. Uh, matter of fact, let's, let's just play the whole clip. Here it is. I got one. Wow, this is a personal best. Are you freaking kidding me? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Do you have a scale? Oh my gosh, mark this spot. <laughs> How much? Come on, man. How much? PB? 7 4? 7 grab it. <laughs> Send him home. Hey, listen, we'll be back in a couple of days, okay? We'll see you in a couple of days. Just kind of hang around. Take a break. Yeah, just go right down there. Now, wasn't that cool? I tell you what, he was so excited. I put that fish on the scale, seven and a half pounds, biggest fish that he's ever caught. And that spot right there is where I actually caught most of my weight on day one of the tournament. It was a kind of an open spot in the hydrilla. The hydrilla wasn't topped all the way out to the surface, so it made it hard to see where the holes were. You had to almost ride around, idle around, and physically look down in the water and use your sonar. 
you know, with um, with the panoptics, the Garmin panoptics allowed me to kind of scan out in front. I could see where the thick hydrilla was. I could see where the gaps were, and I could see those bigger holes. But again, I just kind of ran out of time to spend a lot of time out there, you know, graphing around. But I did catch most of my fish out offshore on day one. And, and you know, when I look back at day one, I had 13 and a half pounds or so, and I... And I wasn't happy with that, but to be honest with you, based on my practice, I was kind of like, well, I survived. You know, 13 and a half pounds is not going to be anywhere close to leading, but you know, I won't be completely out of it. They caught them a little bit better than I thought because those offshore fish really kind of increased every single day. And here's why. As those fish were not pulling up on the beds in the shallows, every single day, more and more fish set up in those groups of fish out offshore. So that offshore bite got better every single day while the shallow bite got worse every single day. So I was really on the back side of a pattern fishing up shallow. And that's something to pay attention to. Are the fish coming to you or going? That's something you have to evaluate. And when I talk about decisions, that is a decision that I made in practice that was wrong. I should have evaluated, planned it a little bit better and listened to my gut a little bit better. I said it from the day, day one of practice when I saw that there wasn't that many fish up that this spawn was probably over, but I kept trying to figure it out when I should have just, look, stopped right then and spent some time offshore, a lot of time offshore. Because talking to a few of the guys like Gussie and Chris Johnson and some of those guys, they spent basically their entire practice out offshore looking for those irregularities out offshore, and, and that paid big dividends for them. They all did great in the tournament, and they all caught big bass. And, uh, and that's really what I learned, is to trust your gut and make good decisions. Pay attention to the signs that are around you and practice so you'll know what is going on. And that will give you the ability to make those better decisions for sure. And stay focused. Stay very, very focused. You know, it, it, going into this next tournament, Lanier, I'm going to stay laser focused. You might even see that the videos might not even be as funny because I'm going to be like not even talking, right? I'm just going to turn the camera on and just like fish, right? Okay, so it's all about trying to get a victory this year. I want to win a tournament this year real bad. Uh, I'm not out of anything. I could potentially still win Angler of the Year if I have a really good remainder of the season. Forestwood Cup is on the line. I have to make that. It's at Lake Washita. I won that tournament back in 2011. The Forestwood Cup here trophy right here behind me. Cup is back on that lake. I love that place. So that was awesome. So, you know, when I look back at day one again, it really boiled down to another issue was missed fish. You know, I hate to complain about missed fish because we all lose fish in a tournament, but for me, I lost a lot of fish. I lost like eight or nine, like so many that even in the video, we didn't even show them all because Brandon was like, dude, it's gonna be like, it's gonna be like a 38 minute video if we don't, if we don't take out some of these misses. So here's a, here, take a look at some of these misses here. And this is what equates to having a 13 pound bag or having a 17 or 18 pound bag. And why is that important? Number one, it's important because it's a lot more weight. But number two, it's a confidence builder. So take, take a look at these, uh, these fish misses here. There is a big one. That's a good one. Oh my gosh. Kidding. Nope. Oh god, money! Dang! Dude, another three pounder. Golly! Right here at the boat, dude. There's one, a good one. Good one. Look right here. He just came off. Oh, you're Unbelievable, dude. Unfreaking believable. Wasn't that crazy? I mean, it didn't matter if I was throwing a swim bait. It didn't matter if I was throwing a wacky rig. It didn't matter what I was throwing. Like, I got to the point where when I set the hook on a fish, I was like, it's going to jump off. And that's the wrong mentality. It was a really, really bad deal for me. Now, what was I throwing out there? I was throwing a speed worm. This is uh, what a lot of guys threw out offshore. This is made by Zoom. It's just a little paddle tail worm rigged up on a little, either a quarter ounce, three sixteenths or quarter ounce weight, trocar offset hook. And this is one of the small ones. We actually threw the Magnum as well. And uh, just make long casts with this and reel it steady. It's kind of like a spinner bait. You know, you're just reeling it steady through the grass. And this is a very weedless way of fishing through the grass. The other, the other way that I caught fish was casting this, this worm around. This is just a straight tailed Cinco style worm, quarter ounce weight, straight shank hook. And that's, that's basically what I threw around. One of the lures that I kind of figured out uh, in the tournament, which was one of those moments, right? So I'm out there fishing. I catch my first big bass that morning. I got a five pounder, pretty cool deal. 
and I can't get any more bites on the worm. And I'm like, you know what? I feel like these fish are feeding on shad, which was a good assessment because the guys that ended up doing well in the tournament, a lot of the guys were throwing white chatter baits, which imitate a shad, right? A lot of guys were throwing lipless crankbaits too. But I thought, you know, they're eating shad out here. I know they are. And I need to throw a shad style bait. So I picked up this bait right here. This is just a paddle tail swim bait on a half ounce head. Just a regular, you'd think that that wouldn't come through the grass very good with an open hook, right? Because that hydrilla was so thick and so clean and crisp, and it wasn't to the surface, this, this head would actually go over the grass pretty good. I didn't get hung up too bad with this. And I could take my panoptics and look out through there, and I could see where the thick stuff is, and I'd see a gap, a big gap, and I could throw the swim bait, come down the edge of the gap. And a lot of these fish would come up. Look at the teeth marks in this thing. I mean, that is crazy. This thing got destroyed. This is actually one that just cut right off my rod. And I caught several nice fish on this, but I lost several nice ones as well. I don't know why they just jumped off. You know, it's, it's, it's just one of those things that happened, but I lost several nice fish. And then when you talk about losing fish, I was losing them on a wacky rig. You know, some of these fish were garden fry and you hear guys talk about garden fry. What is that? That is when a bass has spawned and the bass have hatched out of the eggs. And there's a little cloud, a little brown cloud of like literally 10,000 little tiny bass, like little tiny brown little fish and you see them it's like a little brown cloud and a lot of times the male bass will hang around that school of small fry and kind of guard them and if you see that cloud of, of fry you can take a, a weightless cinco and pitch it in there and it wobbles down through there and that bass will come up and attack and it's a technique that uh, it's really easy to catch them when you find them and usually you don't lose them but I mean I, I lost a lot of fish I mean I, I actually I came very close to a complete meltdown, but I saved it. I didn't say a bad word in this one, but I was all right next to the line. So check this out. This is one inch from a meltdown. Got her. You motherfuckers! So much disc. I mean, how can this freaking be happening to me today, dude? I don't know what words those were. It was like Swahili or something, but I, I don't know. <laughs> but it wasn't, I didn't say a bad word. I almost did. I said them in my mind a little bit, but nevertheless, it was frustrating. It happened all day. Now, day two, I get out there and I'm thinking, okay, you know, if I can fish clean today, I can make some things happen. And day two was a struggle. Day two, I just wasn't getting the bites. Um, you know, I made a move up to the north end of the lake there, an area that, that myself and Matt Airy and a few other guys were fishing and basically just casting worms around. And I, it was weird. It was one of those deals when you're fishing in a big giant grass bed with a lot of boats, it was like almost needed blinders and earplugs because I would be fishing, right? I'd be going down through there, going down. Everybody's just kind of going around a big circle. I'd be going, going, and then I'd hear, get the net, get the net. And I'd look over and the co-angler's got a five pounder. And then I'd be fishing a little bit longer. And then I'd say, oh, it's a good one. It's a good one. And I'd look over and this boat over here, a pro's got a, another five or six pounder, a seven pounder. Or David Dudley's guy, which ended up winning the tournament, pretty cool. He's screaming and yelling because he's got a seven pounder on. It was like that all day long for me. And it's like, I was in this weird rotation where like I would go through there with the same exact lure, the same exact everything and really not get bit, or if I did, I'd miss them or whatever. I missed a couple, and that the other guys would come through and, and catch them. So it was it started kind of messing with me mentally, and, and so lesson for that is if you're around an area where there's a lot of fish being caught, the best thing to do is not get discouraged when someone else catches one, because there's nothing you can do about that. The best thing to do is tell yourself they're biting. They're biting, and let me get ready because I'm probably going to catch one and get excited. Oh man, there's fish here. There's big five pounders here. That guy just caught a five. This guy caught a seven. I'm next. I'm next. Let me get real serious and focused. Not like, oh my gosh, that guy just caught one, a fish I could have caught, or that guy over there just caught a big one that I won't be able to catch now. That's the wrong mental attitude. So staying positive and seeing the good in all these things is, uh, is really, really, really cool. So, um, you know, again, for me, going up there a couple weeks before, seeing all those fish on the beds was a little bit of a hindrance because I just, in my mind, thought that I could find something up shallow. And a good, uh, a good, I guess, here's a good way to look at it, why they weren't up shallow, because Tim Frederick didn't catch them very good in this tournament. He had a bad tournament. And he lives there. and He's a fantastic fisherman. He won Lake Okeechobee. This guy knows more about that system than anybody on the planet, but he loves fishing shallow. He loves sight fishing. John Cox, good friend of mine, one of the best sight fishermen in the world, loves fishing that place, does well every single time. 
he had a bad tournament as well. So when you look at the guys that, that typically do good on that system, they're guys that like to sight fish and up shallow. And, and that's why when you looked at the leaderboard, the top 30 especially, and you started seeing names that you've never seen before, it's because so many of those fish went out in open water and kind of got away from the traditional pattern that we all thought was going to go down. So, you know, speaking of that, speaking of guys uh, first time in the top 10 or first time in the top 30, a good friend of mine, Tony Demetrius. Tony has uh, been fishing the tour for almost 10 years now, a good friend of mine. He owns All One Service, which is a big cleaning service in Atlanta, does a lot of big corporate office stuff. He had a great tournament. Actually, I thought Tony could have won the tournament. As a matter of fact, on the last day, he only caught two fish on day four of the tournament. The last day, he only caught two, a six and like a one pounder. And he only lost by like 10 or 12 pounds. So if he'd have finished out his limit with some decent fish, he would have walked away with this thing. But how was he catching them? He was again out in the grass. But here's a neat story. I did a good deed. So all being said, I didn't get a check. I survived for points, lessons learned, but I did do a good deed and I did feel good about this. So I get a phone call coming in on day two. I go ahead and I, I, I check in, I'm in officially. Still have my fish in the boat. I get a phone call in distress. Tony calls me, he says, dude, I'm broke down. I have a big bag of fish. Can you please come and get me? So the tournament rules say that I can go help him. I call the tournament director. He says, no problem, go rescue him. Says, as long as you're back in on time, he won't get disqualified. So I run across the lake as fast as I can and, uh, and, and save him, rescue him. Here, take, take a look at this. It was a pretty intense moment. And check out this bass he had. This thing is huge. All right, so we just got a phone call that a buddy of mine has broke down. He had 20 pounds. We gotta go get him real quick. Tony, let's put yours in. Okay, these are Tony's co-anglers. Now, how are you gonna know if you got the same pen that you just gave it, me? It's gray, it's gray. Gray, okay. It's gray. I'm gonna put this big one in the live well. You got them all pinned or not? Uh, no, not the big ones. The big ones are not pinned. Because he's gonna die. Put him in my side. I don't have a 10 pounder. Yeah, dude, that's a mega bag. <laughs> okay. That one fish is as big as your belly. Hey. I'm just saying. I thought the thing was 10 pounds. I mean, I, it didn't weigh 10 somehow, but, I, but the head on this thing looked like an 11, to be, I'll be honest with you. He had a big bag of fish that day, 23 pounds or so, made the finals, and again, almost won the tournament. So congratulations to you, Tony. A big high finish, big deal for you. And uh, hopefully that's uh, one of many more to come. And speaking of congratulations, big congratulations to Chris Johnson for winning the tournament. He did fantastic. He stayed focused. He stayed out there on his fish, rotated through a lot of different places out there that he was catching fish on. And he figured out the exact little cadence and the exact bait to fish out there in that grass to the most effective. And for him, I believe it was a white chatter bait for that he caught most of his fish on. Jeff Gustafsson, which has been on the channel a lot, he had a real high finish. I actually thought Jeff was going to win it there at the last minute. But uh, Chris came back at the last moment and actually won the tournament. So that's my 2020, guys. Hope you enjoy these kind of look backs, these little hindsights of these videos. And uh, as always, we're going to be doing these uh, for every tournament, unless I win one, though there's no hindsight 2020. We'll come to you with the I won the tournament video, and I'll get really in-depth on how I won it. So next tournament is Lake Lanier. Do me a favor, guys. Come to the weigh-in at Lake Lanier. Come down there. We're going to be hanging out. Myself, Billy's got a bass, Spinner Worm, Matt Airy, Tom Reddy, all of us are going to be there kind of chilling at the fun zone. If I'm in the finals, I'll be at the weigh-in, and if I'm not in the finals, I'll be at the, at the expo the whole day. So come by, hang out with us. Uh, we'd love to see you and uh, appreciate all the support, guys. And again, do me a favor. Share the video. Let everybody know what we're doing. And uh, that's that. Drop some comments below. I'll answer them. See you. Bam! Because that was for all you that thought I wasn't going to do the bam. Because I can't reach the lens quite that far. But that was for you.